By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Highlander 93-94 online tournament. This is match number three that I'm playing in the group stages with my red and green Tuknir deck. And I'm taking on Mono Blue with Artifacts and this is a build by Chris. So we're playing here match number three in the group stages. And if you've missed any of the other matches, check out the playlist. The info card is popping up right now. So click on there. It'll take you to the uh, playlist with all the matches from this tournament. So today I'm playing against Mono Blue and I'm playing with Red Green. Now do remember, we do have our own points list and our own little rules here. Here you can see the points list of this Highlander 93-94 event. On the left top side you can see the sets that are allowed for this event and then on the rest of the of this picture I guess you can see uh, the points and how they are distributed. So remember you can only spend 10 points in total and this is the list that we've used for this event. Now if you want to know more about Highlander 93-94 and how we played it check out the description of this video there you will also find a link to the tournament website with you know all the decks the results and more information about the rules um, in that same description below you can also find several timestamps one of those timestamps reads mtg games so if you click on there it will take you straight to the game action because i know that some people prefer to first check out the game check out the deck text later um, so that's the easiest way to do that okay now that you're fully informed I'm going to start with the deck decks, and I'm actually going to start with the deck of my opponent today. Let's take a look at the deck of Chris. And here we see the deck of Chris. So this is mono blue, and I have to say it looks it looks so nice. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, what do we have here? We see, of course, some the blue cards that you would expect, right? Control Magic, which is really good in this format. Steel Artifact, which is which is also useful. Talking about all these enchantments, by the way, there's one really cool card in this deck, and that's Enchantment Alteration. So with Enchantment Alteration, you can move an enchant creature or an enchant land from one target to another. And this works together quite well with Control Magic, right? If you play Control Magic on a creature, and then the next turn your opponent plays out a better creature, like, oh, man... But with Enchantment Alteration, you can just switch targets and you can steal that creature. Pretty sweet. We also see a Phantasmal Terrain. So Phantasmal Terrain is an enchant land for two blue that you can cast on the land of your opponent and just turn it into any basic of your choice. And again, works really well with the Enchantment Alteration because you can move it around. Also works really well, of course, with kind of the Island Walk theme that we see here. He is playing, of course, with Lord of Atlantis, with a clone. He's playing with some Merfolk. So all those Merfolks will get Island Walk and plus one, plus one from the Lord. So that is pretty good if you can give your opponent an Island. He's also playing with Sea Singer, a card from Fallen Empires that um, allows you to steal a creature when you tap her, but only if your opponent controls any islands. So I think that Phantasmal Terrain can be quite good. Now, do remember, uh, he's also got Magical Hack, by the way. So those two cards he can use to kind of give the opponent an island. But what I wanted to say is, do remember, this is a 100-card singleton format. So there are only two cards out of the 100. And I think that's one of the things that so far I'm really loving about this format is that there's just so much diversity. Like, every game is different because you're only playing with one-offs, right? Except for the basics. So that also means there's maybe, a, luck is maybe a bigger element in it, but I find it quite interesting, you know, with this 100 card format. Um, what we're seeing for the rest of the deck, just a lot of really, really good cards, obviously. You've got some beef, right? Mamo, Dijin, Water Elemental, Air Elemental. We also have some pretty good artifact creatures in here. Tetravis, uh, Triskelion. I love the combination Tetravis together with uh, Sage of Latinam, by the way. Sage of Latinam. Uh, a card from antiquity is a one two creature uh tap it second artifact draw a card and that goes together of course really well with the tetravis because the tetravis you can split it up in in multiple tetravites and you can create three one one flying tokens and of course keep your own one one flyer and then if you want to you can feed those to the sage to draw cards in return so that's a pretty good investment and also it works together quite well with the triskelion you use the counters that uh, that are on the triskelion to deal damage, kill some creatures of your opponent, and then you get a card as well when it's a 1-1, one, one, you sack it to the Sage to get that card. So that's uh, that's pretty sweet. I think Sage of Latinam is another one of those cards that I'm really liking. Now, um, I'm just going to continue discussing a few really cool cards. Obviously, I'm not going to go through the whole deck, but a few cards I'm really liking here are... Um, the Leviathan, the 3-3 Leviathan, the Segovian Leviathan. And a lot of people wonder why when you're a Leviathan, you're only 3-3. Well, that's because um, this creature comes from the plane Segovia. And in Segovia, it's a dwarf plane. So like my, um, my pinky is as big as a creature there. 
I think. I think that's the story. So that's why when you take a Leviathan from Segovia over in the, the environment of Dominaria and to the other planes, it's just a 3-3, even though in Segovia it is huge. It's probably like an 11-11 in Segovia itself. And you can see that on the picture as well. You can see the whales in the background. So I always thought that was, you know, a pretty cool uh, detail. Now, another really nice card here is Wall of Wonder. I just love that art. And it's so flavorful, like you can you can see this card and think, okay, yeah, I can see how with some weird kind of magic, you can make this a moving wall. It's just, it's such a weird, cool card. And I'm just looking forward to play against it. There are just a lot of cards in here that I think, ooh, I've never played against them or hardly ever. So I'm really looking forward to, to see them in action. Um, okay, this is the deck of Chris. I have to say it looks a little bit slow, but I think once it, it's going, it's quite good. He also has quite a lot of counter magic in there. So I think what's important for me against Chris here is to have a quick start, which is actually something my deck can do. So let's take a look at my uh, red green Tuknir list. And here we see my deck, Welcome to the Ether, and that is a reference to Tuknir Deathlock, a card that's also in this deck. Actually, the deck is built around Tuknir. Uh, my idea of, of making the deck started with this card. So this is a 2-2 flyer, a legendary creature. And it's actually an explorer of the ether if you read the flavor text. And what I really like about this is that it has like a mini giant growth on there, right? I can pay a green, a red, and a tap, and then target creature gains plus two, plus two until end of turn. So I think that's quite sweet. There are a few tricks in the deck with the, the Tuknir. For example, Dwarven Warriors, I can make a creature unblockable, then pump it later with the Tuknir. Or um, I also have, for example, Tracker in the deck, so I can make it a 4-4, and then it can kill out a bigger creature. But I mean, above all, I think, you know, a 2-2 flyer that can pump another creature could be useful in this deck. When we're looking uh, at the strategy of this deck, by the way, it's really your red-green strategy, right? So it is an aggro deck uh, that wants to just wants to have the perfect curve. The first three, four turns, all I really want to do is play a creature and turn a creature sideways. Play a creature, turn a creature sideways, right? I really try to swarm my opponent by playing out all my creatures. And if the game takes longer than expected, I can always win it with an X spell, right? I'm playing Fireball, this Integrate, Dwarven Catapult, Earthquake. Uh, I'm playing with, uh, with Hurricane. I'm playing with Detonate. So th the first goal is to start of the game, I'm going to try to deploy my creatures, like I said deal some damage and then finish it off with direct damage. Now, if that plan doesn't work, I do have a few like bigger creatures in the deck, a bit more controlling creatures like a Cockatrice, like a Thicket Basilisk, uh, also the Killer Beast, which is a gr great way to sink my mana in. I'm also playing with a Two-Headed Giant. So it's not all small stuff. I'm also playing with some bigger creatures so that later in the game, I also have a chance to kind of, to kind of win and it, it's not an, an auto loss if the game takes a little bit longer. Uh, another card I really like talking about the long game is a Thelonite Druid, which is a 1-1 one, one for 1 green and 2 from Fallen Empires. And I can tap the Druid, sacrifice a creature, and then all my forests turn into 2-3 creatures, which I think is kind of cool. I think this is one of the, the stronger cards that you don't see that often, but it can really win you the game uh, out of nowhere. Now, um, maybe it's also good to kind of mention how I spent my points, so you can spend 10 points on the um, cards with points on them. And I've chosen to go for uh, Mox Emerald, Mox Ruby, and Soul Ring. So I really went for the Mana Ramp. The decision, um, I, I did that because I just want to go really quickly. I want to be able to just play everything out. And also I, I figured out that looking at the amount of X spells I have in my deck, the Soul Ring could be really, really good later in the game because yeah, it just adds those two points of damage to your Disintegrate or your Fireball or whatever X spell you're playing. So. I think it's kind of good. It was a tough choice, though, because I think that, for example, a Library of Alexandria would have been quite good in here. And there are, there are some other choices that I could have made, but I really chose to go with uh, the uh, the mana ramping uh, kind of plan. So I thought, you know, let's just go for the two mocks and, uh, and the soul ring. Anyway, this is uh, the deck that I'm playing with today. We talked about the deck of my opponent, and that means we're ready. Let's go to the match. Game number one, here we go. Oh, look at me going here. Double mulligan going down to five. I'm also on the play, I believe. Oh, man. That is not good. This is horrible. Let's hope those five cards are like really good. Maybe Wheel of Fortune in there so I can just, you know, play my cards. Anyway, starting with a forest, passing the turn here. Four cards in hand. No Lunar or Elves, unfortunately for me. So no one drop. No Soul Ring, no Moxen, nothing. There's Chris playing an island. 
So I'm glad they're on his side of the board, but I'll try to keep you up to date about the cards that he plays out. Second forest for me, no play. Ah, that's unfortunate. Like Chris really being the control player in this matchup, or at least I expect he's going to be. So I want to go faster than Chris, but I'm not really doing anything. Look at this. Chris here playing the first creature of this matchup. There's a Merfolk Assassin. Beautiful art card from the dark. A 1-2 creature. Summon Merfolk. Tap and destroy target creature with Island Walk. There's a forest from my side of the board. So three forests and still nothing. And that is a bit disappoint disappointing for me. Perhaps my hand's full of uh, red cards. I mean, I'm missing a mountain here. I can only play half of my deck. And it looks like Chris, yeah, thank you, Chris. Adjusting his camera here. This is much better. Now we can clearly see what he's got on board. Two islands, a Merfolk Assassin. And there's another island. He's probably going to swing in here. Exactly going to put me on 19. Is he going to do something or is he going to pass the turn? Oh, there's a Voldalian Knight. A card from Fallen Empires. It's got First Strike. It's kind of like... The blue knight, like you've got a white knight, black knight, this is kind of the blue knight. So it's a 2-2 first striker for 3. The problem is it cannot attack unless the opponent controls any islands. Oh, and look at this, I'm casting If Biff Afrit. Pretty sweet, so it's a 3-3 creature from Arabian Nights with a built-in hurricane mechanic. One of the better cards in my deck, it's been decisive in some matches already. It's just a really good card for me. And of course, Chris was tapped out, so he couldn't counter. Remember, he's got quite a lot of counter spells in his deck. I believe Flash Counter, Spell Blast, Counter Spell, and a couple of more counters. Power Sync. So it is risky for me to, uh, to cast anything when he's got all his uh, blue mana open still. Here we see a Pendle Haven on the side of Chris. He's going to tap four. What are we going to see for four? Ooh, there's a Phantom Monster, 3-3 three, three Flyer. And of course, Blue's got a lot of Flyers. You've got Phantasmal Forces. You've got Azur Drakes. You've got Air Elementals. Like, there's just a lot of flying creatures in there. And this is just, just a 3-3 three, three Flyer without an ability. But of course, it's perfect here because, you know, Chris probably going to attack. And, I mean, I probably don't want to trade it for my If Biff. But, I mean, if I don't, I take 3 damage every turn. The problem is, if I do and I trade, then of course Chris can still attack with his Merfolk Assassin, so I really don't want to trade, and of course the if if is just really, really good, but maybe I have to. Anyway, let's see what Chris is going to do. I'm expecting him here to just attack with the Phantom Monster first. Or perhaps he's got more options. I mean, if he, for example, would have, would have a Control Magic... That actually wouldn't be a good play, because if it would try to control magic, my if Biff, I would probably just put three green into the if Biff, destroying the if Biff and the Phantom Monster. And everybody would take three points of damage, so the control magic is probably not the way to go here. I mean, of course, I have no idea if that's what Chris is, is thinking about. I think another thing with his deck is because he's got so much uh, counter magic in there, he's got to think, am I going to play something out and tap out, having the risk that my opponent's going to play out something good? Or am I going to keep the counter spell in hand? I think in this case, for Chris, you don't really have to play out anything. I would just attack with the Phantom Monster first and see what I'm going to do. Like perhaps if I trade the Phantom Monster for the If Biff, he could consider playing another flyer after that. There's the attack first. I'm taking the damage here. Really don't want to block yet. Of course, 19 is still pretty high. Dropping to 16 here, not too bad. And he's going to tap four. No, he's going to untap them again. Changing his mind here. Does he have another creature, for example, for four? Passing the turn, so keeping his mana untapped. Tapping two green here. What do I have? Okay, there's a Whirling Dervish. So a 1-1 one, one creature, originally from Legends. It's got protection from black. That's not very relevant. What is relevant, though, is that I can use the Pendlehaven on it, making it a 2-3. And every time it deals damage, it's going to get a 1-1 one, one counter, a plus 1-1 one, plus one counter. You got it, it, it has some nice little synergy with Dwarven Warriors that's also in this deck. There's the attack. 3-3 three, three through the air. And I'm not taking the trade, taking even more damage. So the Phantom Monster already has hit me for 6. I wonder, maybe I should have traded... You know, I'm definitely next turn. Like, I can't really 
keep this up. I was probably hoping for a card like a Cockatrice or perhaps to find some red mana. Maybe I've got a Lightning Bolt in hand or, you know, some other kind of removal. Obviously, there's a lot of dark damage in my deck, but as long as I don't have a mountain, there's nothing I can do, really. I think the best thing to do now is just attack with the uh, Whirling Dervish. And then probably Chris is going to double block, but I can pump it with the Pendlehaven, making it a 2-3, and then I can choose what creature I want to kill on the side of Chris. Probably the Vidalian Knight. I guess I don't want to make that trade, though, passing the turn here. I mean, the problem is I'm not really doing anything. I'm just playing out one once, hoping for something to change. And in the meanwhile, I'm taking damage from the Phantom Monster. That's not really something that I can keep up. And I think if you're Chris, you're like, you know what? This is fine. Fine by me. I'm winning the game. And here we finally see me blocking the Phantom. I mean, that's something at least. And let's see if Chris now has something. Remember, he wanted to play something for four earlier. Look at this. Tapping four. What are we going to see? Ooh, there's a clay statue. That is kind of difficult. Clay statue, a 3-1 creature uh, from the Antiquities set. I believe this is a copy from the 4th edition. And for 2, you can regenerate it. And that's, of course, a problem for me, that regeneration. That's going to make it really hard for me to block and deal with it. I mean, I'm just, I guess my hand's full of red cards and I'm hoping to draw a mountain. Like, if I could find a mountain here, and we just have some burn, because Chris cannot regenerate the clay statue at the moment. It's two mana. He only has one mana untapped. Passing the turn. Ah. This is so bad, you know? This is just so frustrating, because Chris was kind of tapped out, so I had an opening here to play something out. And, of course, I need to kill that, uh, that clay statue. He's probably going to swing in here, and I have to make the decision. Am I going to trade here? For the Lanawer, for example. Nope, taking even more damage. I'm on 10. Life total halved. Chris, still on 20. I mean, what I need right now, maybe to draw into red, uh, play wheel, and just draw like a perfect 7? Just to get me back into this? There's a Mox Emerald, not the Mox Ruby. Beautiful card, but it's not going to help me. Passing the turn. I mean, things are looking up for Chris. I mean, all he has to do is just attack again with the clay statue. And he's not even drawing that good. I mean, it's not bad, but he's not drawing that good. But there's just nothing I can do here. Taking damage again, hit after hit. Going to drop to seven. And I mean, if I don't gonna, if, if I'm not going to block with it, with the creatures anyway, why not just attack, you know, and put some pressure on with the Pendlehaven and the, and the Whirling Dervish? Finally finding a red source. I was really hoping for something else than a Curd Ape, but a Curd Ape it is. 2-3 creature, the Monkey Man. Oh, we're, we're actually going to see a counterspell here. Oh, I forgot the name of this counterspell. It comes from Legends. This is a copy from Chronicles. One blue and one, and it can only counter creatures. It's, a, it's, it's cool. I like the cards. Pretty cool art. There's the attack, the 3-1. Finally deciding to block here on the Lanawer Elves. I mean, look at my life total. I'm quite low. I'm on 7. Of course, Chris regenerating here for 2. I mean, this match is a walk through the park for Chris so far. There's really not much I can do. Oh, there's a Timmy. More problems here. I mean, he can start... Uh, Pinging me down on life total or just try to kill my Whirling Dervish. This is not great. Again, Chris, only one blue open. So he is giving me a little opening here. Can I find a way to get rid of the statue? Yes, I can. Okay, this is something at least. Playing a lightning bolt on the clay statue. A beautiful copy uh, signed by Christopher Rush. And it usually has a special place in my revised binder, but I took it out. Put it in this deck. It's always a joy to play these cards. Passing the turn here to Chris. One of the things that Chris could do is pass turn and on end step use the Tim on my um, Whirling Dervish. Then I'm probably going to pump it with the Pendlehaven. But the next turn he can kill it because my Pendlehaven will be tapped. Anyway, Chris here having a strip mine. Probably going to strip the mountain. Yeah, I think that's a good decision. Must be tempting to go for the Pendlehaven. But... The mountain is really the way to go here. I mean, that's the most dangerous thing for Chris. So that I can find some kind of red spell, you know, to get me back into it. Maybe an earthquake, for example. Um, you know, so that's something to worry about. 
here for Chris. So it makes sense that he's going to go for the mountain. And now he's going to use the protocol sorcerer in his own turn. That's a little bit surprising. Because now, of course, I can make the Whirling Dervish a 2-3 because of the Pendlehaven. And that means it's going to survive the damage from the Tim. So probably a little mistake here from Chris. The better line would have been to uh, wait for my end step and uh, ping then. But it doesn't matter much, I feel, for the outcome of this first game. There's an Azur Drake. Has a really cool flavor text. A 2-4 flyer, 1 blue and 3. Or sorry, uh, yeah, 1 blue and 3, it's a 2-4 flyer. There we see an Ice Storm. I mean, this Ice Storm, it's nice. It's nice. But is this the best that I can do? <laughs> you know, I'm on 7, I'm dying. And I'm playing an Ice Storm. Um, yeah, this is, this is not going to gonna cut the cake very problematic face here for me probably gonna see the azure swinging in again gonna put me on five at least i assume maybe he's got better options yep there's the attack gonna put me on five now he can also consider just using the tim on my life total There's a mountain at least. Okay, can I do something? I really need not to pass the turn. I'm passing the turn. Whatever, man. <laughs> this, is, this is not my first game. The only positive about this for me is that maybe I've had all my bad luck here in game one. It's going to change in game two. There's the attack with the Drake dropping to three. You can ping me down to two and then kill me next turn with an attack by the Azur Drake. If, of course, I don't find something. Tapping two here. What are we going to be? Ah, Felwer Stone. That is, that is, that is, that is disappointing. There's the ping dropping to two. I guess it's the end of the road here. Maybe I've got some kind of instant, but I doubt it. There's the attack. That's it. Picking up my dice. Game one going here to Chris's blue forces. And I have to say, Chris, you didn't even have to draw that good of, good of a bunch of cards. But um, it was a walkover here for you in game one. Uh, we are going to shuffle up. And hopefully I can give you a decent match in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. Of course, I'm still on the play after losing that first game. Starting here with a mountain. So at least I found a mountain. It would be kind of funny if now I couldn't find any forests. Actually, the, oh, seriously? Second mountain pass. Chris, of course, starting with an island. Oh, man, that would be brutal, actually. If now for this game, I cannot play the other half of my deck. There is a temple being played out by Chris, the Sackland. Another mountain. I need to learn to shuffle better, I guess. There is a Granite Gargoyle, a 2-2 flyer, and I can pay a red to give a plus 0, plus 1. So that's actually a really good turn 3 play for me. The temple is the, the Sackland from, um, from Fallen Empire, so it comes into play tapped. Now it's untapped, uh, of course. You can tap it for 1 blue, but you can also tap and sack it for 2 blue. So it's kind of ideal when you want to keep the possibility to, to counter open. Exactly. You just keep the temple untapped and you use the other islands. That way you always have counter magic open. There's a phantasmal terrain. So it's probably going to make an island here out of one of my mountains. There we go. So that's now an island. And drawing for turn. There's another mountain. I mean, this is this is just... This is so silly to look back at. I'm like, okay, game one, I couldn't find a mountain to save my life. Oh, this is really good, actually. Can I complain about this? Turn four, Juggernaut. So turn three, Gargoyle. Turn four, Juggernaut. I mean, that is really good. That's what the deck wants to do. No counter magic, by the way, uh, by Chris. So that's kind of lucky for me as well. And I guess if you're Chris, you really need to find something to block the Juggernaut with. Number four here, uh, island or land number four, I should say. So three islands and a temple. I mean, still artifact would be quite nice here for Chris as well. Tapping four. Ooh, the clay statue. It's okay. It can kill the Juggernaut next turn. But remember, it needs two uh, mana to regenerate. It doesn't have two mana open at the moment. So at least I get one swing in here. And maybe I've got a shatter or some other way to get rid of that clay statue. So Chris here dropping to 11, I believe. Let's see what I can do. Five cards in hand. Passing turn, though. That is unfortunate. Like, I need, 
I need a shatter or something, disintegrate, just something to get rid of that clay statue so I can keep swinging in with the Juggernaut. Now remember, Juggernaut a 5-3 has to attack every single turn. Clay statue a 3-1 with regeneration for 2, so it's the perfect blocker for the Juggernaut. So hopefully I can find some way to get rid of the clay statue. So there's the pass of the turn, untapping my creatures. Let's see what I can do. Okay, there's a four, so at least I have access to green now as well. Yep, there I go, have to attack with the Juggernaut. There's the block, probably regenerating it for two. I mean, another nice card here would have been Berserk. But I guess I don't have it. Chris dropping to nine. Second main, can I do something here? Tapping four, keeping the green untapped. Nope, tapping the green as well. Okay, there's the two-headed giant, a 4-4 four, four trampler. Or we're going to see a counter spell. There's counter magic again, taking care of the giant. Going to go to the bin. And passing the turn here. So I'm on 20, Chris here on 9. At least it's going a lot better for me than in, uh, in game one. But I am a little bit worried. Chris now having six mana to his disposal. He's got a lot of like more expensive cards in his deck. Really more the control player than me in this matchup. Kind of worried, for example, that he could play Tetravus here. First he's going to swing in, of course. I'm going to drop it to 17. Let's see what else he can do. Kind of keeping my fingers crossed here that he cannot play out anything scary. Gonna tap four. Are we gonna see a ghost ship, an Azure Drake, Phantom Monster, Wall of Wonder? Okay, I'm lucky here. Wall of Wonder, not my biggest problem. Although, remember, you can make the Wall of Wonder into a walking Wall of Wonder by playing a, paying two blue and a two. Then it turns into a 5 1 creature that can attack. And then he can actually deal eight damage to me, and he could put me on nine. Attacking nonetheless, so going to put Chris here on 7. And I mean, where are my Bloodlusts and my Giant Groves and my Combat Tricks? Okay, tapping 2 here, a green and an island. What are we going to see? Okay, there's the Dragonfly. So this is a 1-1 flying creature from Legends. And uh, I believe you can give it first strike as well, but that's 2 green to give it first strike. I only have 1 green though. But at least I can use it to block the Wall of Wonder if Chris decides to attack with it. I mean, I wonder if he wants to trade the Dragonfly for a Wall of Wonder. Then again, the Dragonfly is, of course, a flyer, so that is also kind of difficult, difficult for Chris to deal with. There is another island here on the side of Chris. I mean, it would be cool to see an attack by the Wall of Wonder here. That would be really sweet. I wonder then if I'm going to block. Perhaps I'm just going to take the damage and the next turn going to keep my Dragonfly as a blocker. I won't have to two green open to give, uh, to give the fly first strike. Oh, there we see a Dance of Many. What is he going to copy? I mean, he could go for the Clay Statue. Could also choose to copy the Gargoyle. The problem is he doesn't have any red sources. So it's just a 2-2. Two -two. I think he chooses to copy the Gargoyle here. 2-2 two -two Flyer, which is not too bad for me though. But he's going to do something else. There's a Vesuvan Double Ganger. So now he's got two Gargoyles on the battlefield. Then of course he can double block the Gargoyle, I guess. But then again, I've got Mountains open. Well, we'll just have to wait and see what he does. But I mean, this is a problem for me. Going from zero flying creatures to two flying creatures for Chris. That is, a, that is an issue. So now he has two, two, two flying gargoyles and a wall of wonder and of course that clay statue. And I've got my one, one flyer and my gargoyle as well. I guess what I really need is just some burn to, to finish the game and one more land, I guess, or two more lands. Chris being quite low here on, uh, on seven. Okay, there's another forest. 
So I've got enough lands this uh, this game, enough forests, enough mountains. Can I complain about that? And I am attacking here because, of course, I can pump it. I can give it five in the defense. So even if he double blocks it, it is not going to die. So this is difficult for Chris. It looks like he is going to double block. That's a bit of a mystery to me. Or am I missing something? I think I can make it a 2-5 here. So it looks like we're kind of discussing combat at the moment. So I think Chris is still thinking what he wants to do. Oh, and we're trading here. Why am I not using the mountains? That is surprising. I mean, I can use the mountains here to make the gargoyle give it plus zero, plus one, making it into a two five, then it wouldn't die. So I'm a little surprised about my move. Look at this tapping out completely. But I mean, I'm going to put him on one. I'm not going to be able to kill him if this is like a fireball, for example. I'm going to keep one green open. Oh, there's a hurricane. Okay, that makes sense. I wanted to cast a hurricane. So I'm going to play a hurricane here for, for six, it seems. I'm going to kill all the flyers, put me on 11. And put Chris on one. Okay, that, that kind of makes sense. I could have waited, maybe. I don't know what else is in my hand, of course. Maybe I've got another burn spell to finish the deal. I was already surprised. I'm like, why am I not, you know, saving my gargoyle here in this exchange? But I wonder if this was the good move. It's interesting. I'm looking back at how I played here at the Highlander event and just a lot of things I did. I'm like, eh. for example, I could have played the um the hurricane for two then i could have saved my gargoyle and attack with my gargoyle that would have meant that chris would have lost his two flyers and he would have taken two damage from the gargoyle and two from the hurricane he would be on three instead of one and now i've lost oh look at this wall of wonder attack that is sweet i'm loving it man attacking for eight it's gonna put me on three I mean, I, I, I assume that I have some kind of way to deal that last point of damage or else this is just absolutely horribly bad on my side. Okay, there's a jam day tome here. So at least he cannot counter. So you don't have to worry about that. There's another mountain. Okay. Oh, of course, giving it haste with the Concordant Crossroads, winning here against Chris. Wow. Was that really my plan? I guess that was my plan. Concordant Crossroads and the, uh, the Cockatrice. I guess. Okay, I guess. I guess. Fair enough. And look at this. Chris showing that he could have played his Air Elemental as well instead of attacking with the Wall of Wonder. That would have been really good, actually, Chris. That probably would have given you game number two. So... Like I said, I am not really impressed with how I'm playing in this tournament so far. But hey, it's going quite well. I'm, I'm on 1-1. One -1. I've won my two previous matches. If I can win here in game number three, I'm probably uh, going to make it into the top 16. So uh, you know what? Let's shuffle up and go to that all deciding game number three. Game number three, here we go. The Decider, Chris on the play for the first time in our match. Starting here with a Soul Ring turn one. Now, that is an opener, Chris. That is really good. Wow. And I'm just starting with a Forest and a Pass. Again, no uh, turn one play for me. Let's see what Chris can do. There's another island. Can there be a follow-up? Maybe an Azur Drake or a Ghost Ship? Nope, just a Pass turn. There's a turn two play for me, though. A detonate here on the soul ring. That is quite nice. Also dealing a damage with that detonate. So Chris here dropping to 19. And yeah, I mean, this detonate is perfect. Also no counter spell from Chris. No power sink. So that's good. And Chris finding his third island. Tapping two islands. There's a phantasmal terrain. I wonder what he's going to pick. Yep, gonna pick for red. So that's now an island. So I've got an island and a forest. Tapping the forest and the island. What are we going to see for two here? I've got a lot of two drops in the deck. Well, Lily Wolf, Elvish Archers, Barbary Apes. Just have a lot of options. Grizzly Bears. 
Dragonfly. And it's going to be, oh, it's going to be, oh, what are they called again? A 1-1 flyer. And uh, for one green and tap, I can make a red mana. Fire sprites, I think. But correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, these are cards I don't play often, but it's quite nice because I can filter my green and make it into a red mana with the uh, fire sprites. Passing the turn back to Chris. What can he do? There's another island for him. Passing the turn, so I'm going to untap. Let's see if, I can, if I'm going to use the ability of the sprites. That would be quite cool. Nope, just attacking for one. Going to put Chris on 18. Tapping two. So pretty light on lands here. Finding Elfish Archers 2-1 first strike. Six cards in hand. So this would be a great blocker for that annoying clay statue, by the way. Chris finding land number five. Now remember, Chris has some pretty big creatures in the deck. Tapping five. Are we going to see a water elemental, an air elemental? Or, of course, okay, the avian. So this is an 04, the Clockwork Avian from Antiquities. It comes into play with four plus one plus O oh, uh, uh, counters, not creatures, <laughs> counters. Every time it attacks after combat, it loses one of those counters. And during your upkeep, you can choose to put the counters back on by paying a colorless mana for each counter. But then the, uh, the Clockwork Avian remains tapped. Here we see a Wailuli Wolf. So, I mean, again, I've got problems with the lands. This time I'm just not finding enough lands, but at least I'm able to play quite a lot with just the two mana. Wailuli Wolf now hitting the board. And this is difficult for Chris, right? Because if he attacks with, the, uh, with his Flyer, then of course he opens himself up to an attack by the, uh, the Archer, the Wolf, and uh, the Sprites. Tapping six here, it seems. What are we going to see? Oh, an Amnesia. That is brutal. Amnesia here. Taking care of my entire hand, probably. Oh, look at this. Look at what I'm losing. Oh, this is horrible. Absolutely horrible. I, I had a really good hand there. I had a really, really good hand. I think this Amnesia could be the thing that's going to give Chris the victory. Of course, I had no lands in hand because I've already missed two or three land drops this, uh, this decisive game number three. No cards in hand anymore. This is absolutely devastating for me. Losing a Disintegrate, a Stormseeker, a Regrove, an Often Troll, a Brothers of Fire, and a Killer Bees. At least I'm finding a land from the top of the deck. But yeah, I mean, it's a little bit too late here. Nothing left for me to play out with that land. All I can do is pass the turn and... Wow. This is just horrible for me. I believe Chris also only has... One card in hand, it's hard to see with the dark sleeves. Oh man, this is so bad. No two cards in hand, it seems. I mean, what I need right now is a mountain and then a wheel of fortune. You know, that can kind of get me back into this. I mean, what can you do, you know? Amnesia... What a killer. What a killer. There's the attack, the 4-4. So does it mean that he's got another creature dropping here to 16? Tapping 2 blue for a Sage. So playing out the Sage of Latinam. Looks like Chris here is reading the card. So at the end of combat, after damage is dealt, it's going to lose that counter. So it's now a 3-4. And every time it attacks, it loses another counter. That's basically how these, uh, these clockwork creatures work. Looks like he's got another option. Tapping four. What are we going to see for four? Control magic. Ay, 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 ay. This is just really, really bad for me. I wonder if he's going to go for the fire sprites. Nope. He's going to go for the uh, elfish archers. A 2-1, the 2-1 first striker. I mean, he could consider going for the, for the sprites because they can make red mana. And of course, now I'm finding lands from the top of my deck after the Amnesia. I mean, this is what magic is sometimes, right? I mean, sometimes you win because you're lucky because your opponent stumbles on lands. And sometimes it's the other way around. And yeah, I got to tell you, it feels really bad. But probably if you're, if you're a fan of this channel, you know what it feels like because you play magic. It's part of the game. There's the attack with the 1-1 Flyer, putting Chris on 17. Oh, man. This is just really bad. 
And Chris, of course, can now attack with my Archer and, of course, the Clockwork Avian dealing 5 points of damage. Could put me on 11. Because I don't think I'm going to block on the Wailuli. There's the attack. There I go in life. Losing 5 points. Dropping here to 11. At least the Avian is losing another counter. And there's the pass of the turn. One card in hand. Am I going to attack here again with the sprites? That's exactly what I'm going to do. Going to put Chris probably on 16. I mean, this is looking really good for Chris. That amnesia was just perfect. Absolutely perfect. Probably gave him the victory here of this, uh, of this match. He's not there yet. Of course, I'm still on 11. There's the attack, so that means uh, four more points of damage. Exactly, dropping here from 11 to 7. The Avian is going to become a 1-4. And there's the pass. Okay, so at least Chris is not putting more threats on the board. That's something. Second red. Look at that. Looks like I'm going to tap. What am I going to do? One red and two. Oh, there is a Wheel of Fortune. Whoa, now this gets interesting. There's the wheel. Are we going to see a counter spell? Nope, we're not. Oh, a trike on hand. I wonder why he didn't play out the Triskelion, to be honest, because it's so good. Also with the Sage. Could have killed both of my creatures, then sack it to the Sage to draw another card. Anyway, I guess I'm lucky that he didn't for some reason. Now we're both going to draw. Could this be the turnaround? Now remember, I already played out of the land, so I only have one green and one red open. But hey, it's, I'm not complaining. I mean, this Wheel of Fortune from the top of the deck, I mean, that was the only thing that kind of can get me back into this. There's an Asp, the 1-1 one, one creature from Arabian Nights. Beautiful art. Tapping a red as well. There's a Chain Lightning. What am I going to kill here? Going to kill my own Archer. Interesting. Looks like I'm a little bit in the tank here, wondering what I want to do. And of course, Chris can also counter this Chain Lightning. Maybe that's the case. He's got a full grip of cards. He is going to play a Power Sink here. That means the Archer is here to stay. I was actually wondering, maybe I should go for the Sage instead of the Archer in this case. Then again, I mean, if he's going to sack the Clockwork Avian to the Archer, uh, to the Sage, I don't really mind. But now, of course, Chris gets to untap with seven cards in hand after the draw. Remember, he played the Power Sync, so went down to six. Uh, got his card for turn back up to seven. Two, four, six, seven lands for him. There's the attack with the one, four. Probably, I mean, I can block. I can pump it up with the Wailuli Wolf. Wonder what I'm going to do. I mean, am I going to take the damage? Looks like I'm going to block and I'm going to pump it with the wolf. Exactly. So it's a 2-2. Two -two. So it survives. It don't take any damage. So that's the good news. I guess Chris is going to sack it to the Sage. Or else, why would he attack? Or perhaps he's going to planning on uh, making it back into a 4-4 next turn during your upkeep. Remember that it does tap itself. This is a big problem, by the way. This... Uh, Prodigal Sorcerer, this Timmy card, this is a huge problem for my deck. I mean, I'm, my deck is full of 1-1s. One Look at my board. You can destroy my entire board with that Tim. This is a big problem. Need removal for that uh, Prodigal Sorcerer here. I mean, I still have five cards in hand. Hopefully, there's something useful in there. Tapping three here, an island and two green. And a mountain tapping four. Ooh, and a forest five in total. What are we going to see for five? Thicket Basilisk. Thicket Basilisk Lure is a combo that is in the deck. Actually, am I playing with Lure? I'm not quite sure now that I think about it. Yes, I am playing with Lure. Yeah, so Thicket Lure is, is a possibility. Oh, Mana Drain though. Mana Drain. Ah, oh, painful. I mean, it makes sense that he's got a lot of counter magic after the wheel, but you kind of hope you got to play towards your outs. You know, you got to make these gambles. I don't have the luxury with seven life to just wait. 
And I mean, he's got so much mana, the chances that he's going to tap out are quite slim. So I had to take this risk, but it's looking really bad for me. What if Chris now finds the Brain Geyser? I mean, that would be insult after injury. Oh, look at this. Okay, that's also good. And uh, Chris not putting the counters back on on his uh, Clockwork Avian. I think, Chris, but correct me if I'm wrong in the comments that this is the first time that you're playing with the Clockwork Avian. And um, I understand what you're going through because I'm actually playing with a lot of cards in my deck that I don't want to say I played it for the first time, but I haven't played with it in a long time. So a lot of cards that I have to reread and read again as well. So Chris kind of missed the fact that he could also uh, rewind it or wind it up in his upkeep. And uh, I, I believe he didn't want to want to change that, I think. He said, no, 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 it's my mistake. It looks like he's on, on 14. Yep, and now in his upkeep, he's going to put the counters back on. I mean, it's still looking really, really good here for Chris. And really bad for me. It looked like I just didn't play anything out past the turn. You're back to Chris. Four cards in hand. And I think that the thing that Chris can do now is just slowly kind of ping my creatures away with the, with the Timmy. You know, advance his board even further. Yeah, past the turn here. So I'm playing a mountain. Tapping a mountain and an island. There's a Felwer Stone. It's funny how you always draw the Felwer Stone when you don't need it. Like, like midway in the game when you've got tons of mana. There's the ping. Going to drop to six. So he's not even going to try to kill my creatures. He's like, you know what? I can do it this way. Of course, he's, he can now attack again with the Avian being a 4-4. Four, four. One of the things that he could have done is on Ncept tried to kill my, uh, my Fire Sprites. I then would have probably saved it with the Wolf. And then in his own turn, he could have killed it and then attacked for 4 with the Avian. Now I'm probably going to chump. Exactly going to chump here. So it's going to save me some damage. Avian dropping to a 3-4. Yeah, this is, it's looking really good for Chris here in match uh, game number three. There is a mountain tapping it. Curd Ape. I was kind of hoping for at least a lightning bolt on the Tim. Passing the turn. Is he going to ping me? Put me on five. Oh man, I'm so close to dying here. Can attack me with his flyer. Put me on two. There he goes. And what if Chris, you know, didn't have that amnesia? We would have seen such a different game because remember, after that amnesia, I started to draw my lands. And my hand was quite good. But hey, that's, uh, it is what it is in Magic. Oh, this is stylish though. Pirate ship next to the Tim. I love it. I really love it. And I'm pointing out that I do have an island. So he's feeling at home uh, on my uh, part of the, the battlefield. And yeah, there's no way I'm going to I'm going to win this. Man, but hey, let's finish it. Let's see what so I can I do. Two forests I don't know in if hand. I have an out, but let's have a look. A dragon well. Nope, that is not enough. I think the only card that could have saved me, was there a card that could have saved me? I don't think so. Anyway, playing a playing a forest. Let's finish this. Going to tap four probably for the dragon whelp. And then of course, Chris here's going to ping me to one probably on end step. One card in hand. Yep. Going to ping me to one. And then he can choose if he wants to kill me with the pirate ship or with the protocol sorcerer. What a luxury here. Chris winning it against me. So my first loss in the tournament. Two wins, one loss. I need to win my last match. And my last match uh, is against a blue and red deck. Ooh, that sounds pretty scary. These are some of the cards that you can find in that deck. And that match will be on the channel next week. So if you want to see me battle for a spot in the top 16 of the Timmy Talks Highlander 93-94 tournament, please come back again next week. And before you go, please take a moment to like, comment, and share. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. Something else that you can do is, of course, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. If, of course, you're not a subscriber yet, and the chances are you probably are because Timmy Talks keeps growing, and thank you so much. 
for all your support. And if you really enjoy and like the content that I make, please consider becoming a patron. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And uh, please consider becoming a sponsor through the Patreon program. And if you do, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. And you can also join tournaments like this one. And your name will be in the end scroll at the end of every video. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?